the uh, the the silver and uh, gold space. It's got a lot of investors, uh, very very um, agitated, anxious. I don't know whatever whatever term you want to describe it. People are worried that we're sort of stuck in this range. So let's start with sort of your macro outlook on what's been keeping gold and silver from breaking out even higher. Well, yeah, I still believe we're on a strong upward trend and we keep on bouncing off a higher bottom uh, is, is the way I'd look at it. Uh, you know, here's what I would, here's what I would um, you know, um, lay out in terms of the framework is that we've seen stronger precious metal prices now for about four or five years in a row. And what happened last year with this pandemic was that we had a, a, you know, a dramatic acceleration in that value in precious metal prices. As the world's finding a way to survive through this pandemic, I think that pandemic impact is wearing a little bit off. But you know, we're still dealing with good, strong precious metal prices. And it doesn't take much. Uh, in fact, I can't find a single vector that shows long-term weakness in precious metals. When you sit and look at uh, what, what's going to re- be required around the world in terms of reestablishing economies and the efforts uh, that, that governments are going to have to put in place to try and, and, and stimulate uh, growth or stimulate, um, <laughs> let's not even stimulate growth, to stop the uh, collapse, um, you know, there's uh, the, the amount of monetary stimulus, which, you know, face it, is, is printing money that, that's going to be required. Uh, just it all bodes so well for precious metals in the longer term. And so even though we're near record highs in terms of gold and, uh, and, and very, very strong silver prices, uh, we at Wheaton are still uh, looking to make investments because we're still very bullish on, uh, on, uh, on commodity prices and precious metal yeah. prices. I think context is important because, yes, the gold price has been consolidating for a few months, but we are still at very high prices. Is this, is this, a, is this a price that's very uh, – is it a healthy price for the sector? Well, there's no doubt, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, gold mining companies that we've seen out there are, are, are exercising some pretty strong discipline in terms of trying to keep some conservative, um, um, you know, uh, forecasting conservative resource prices and stuff like that. And, and we're seeing stronger and stronger balance sheets across the uh, precious metal space. So uh, this is a healthy, uh, healthy price for the industry. Um, as long as we measure gold in U.S. dollars, though, I, I do believe that uh, we're going to see even stronger prices. And silver, what are your thoughts about silver? Can it outperform gold this year, underperform? What are your thoughts? You know, I, I, uh, the fundamentals behind silver are stronger than they are for gold, mainly because there's a just ever-growing um, uh, a demand, industrial demand. And, and it's, in, it's in sectors that are very, very important to society and getting more and more important to society, mobility. Uh, if you need mobile power, if you if you're going to do anything off of batteries, uh, if you want to uh, generate uh, silver has an attribute it generates electricity. Or sorry, generates it transmits electricity better than any other conducts electricity better than any other noble metal. Highest resi- highest conductivity, lowest resistivity, and so you're always going to find silver in 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 anything that relates to mobility. That's all the way from electric vehicles. To smartphones and think about where the world's going in terms of mobility. Think about the, where the world's going with respect to the response to the pandemic and the fact that you know the requirements to be even more mobile. Uh, um, it just continues to look very, very promising for silver. And so we've seen silver outperform gold over 2020. Uh, I think we're going to see silver continue to outperform gold. The other, the other factor that I like about silver is that it, it tends to have a more retail. Um, market. And so when we do see an uptick in, in silver prices, it generally reflects uh, an increasing uh, level of interest from the retail side into precious metals. And, uh, and the fact that we've seen silver strengthen over the last year tells me that the retail side is waking up to precious metals and working their way back into the space. So, so very bullish on silver. The challenge that we at, at Wheaton have is that there's just not a lot of silver opportunities out there. And one of the reasons that we spread into uh, precious metals as a whole, and, and we're actually now generating over 60% of our revenue from gold, uh, but we still have over 30% of our revenue coming from silver. Um, you know, that in itself is also an indication of uh, support for higher silver prices. The fact that we can't find ways to invest into silver, uh, it's, or it's very challenging to find ways to invest into silver, means that there's going to be, a, there's not going to be a, a, a boost in, in a strong boost in supply anytime soon. That's, that leads me to my next question. You brought up all the uh, demand uh, drivers for silver. I wonder if there's enough silver in the ground to even meet that demand in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. 
Well, what's interesting about silver is that the bulk of silver actually is produced as a byproduct from base metal operations. Okay. And I'm happy to report that what we're seeing is a is a is a bit stronger uh, prices in base metal. We've we've definitely seen a move up in copper. We're starting to see it in zinc and uh, and and even nickel. The bulk of silver actually comes from lead zinc mines, and so. So we at Wheaton, of course, our business is supplying capital to that base metal industry by purchasing this non-core byproduct precious metals off of these base metal mines. And we have seen a real uptick in opportunities, in, uh, in, in, in the need for capital. What we're seeing is base metal companies with these slightly higher prices are starting to, to invest back into the ground. And we haven't seen that for many years in the base metal sector. Um, I spoke to David Garofalo, whom you must know from your gold cord days. Uh, he told me that the industry is facing an existential crisis. That those were his words because of the uh, running, the, uh, the the reserves running out in the ground. How, how do you respond to that? Well, it's uh, I call it ge geological inflation. Uh, you know, here's what we're running into: is it's uh, it's getting tougher and tougher. We're going to have to go deeper. We're going to have to go farther afield in in in, in tougher locations. The cost of producing it and and the uh, and the challenges of producing. Now, you know, don't get me wrong. We're also making great, strong technical advances in terms of recovery rates and uh, you know and, and optimizing uh, operations to try and cut costs and uh, and and do it more efficiently and more effectively. But um, but it is you know there's only so much surface on this earth and. Uh, um, and and you know as it gets tougher and tougher to build mines, all that does is is limit supply, which of course is positive for for uh, those of us that already have good strong asset portfolios. So, given everything we've just discussed, how are you tying this into Wheaton's strategy? Oh, uh, I mean, our strategy has always been focused on growth. Uh, you know, we're a company that uh, that operates at very high margins, generates very high cash flows. And, and our objective is to put that money back into the ground. And, you know, we feel the best place for our, uh, for our capital to go is to, to continue growing that bank of ounces that we've got. Uh, you know, currently we've got over 30 years of reserves in front of our uh, portfolio. We've got uh, 31 different assets delivering us metal, or sorry, 31 different assets, 23 of which are delivering us metal today. And, and all of that uh, gives us over 30 years of reserves and an additional 20 plus years of inferred resources and seven years of measured and indicated resources. You add that up, well over 60 years of, of current life. But we, we, we continue to look for ways to add more value. Uh, our shareholders, I mean, they invest into us because they want good access to good, strong, confident, profitable precious metals production. And so we continue to, to look for opportunities to take our cash flow and put it back in. 2021 looks promising. It looks like, you know, at current prices, it, it wouldn't surprise me to see us somewhere close to a billion dollars in cash flow this year. Um, and my, my job is to put that money to work. Yeah. And what are some of the um, common concerns that investors have asked you over the last couple of months, uh, if, you, if you could just narrow it down to a trend? Uh, well, uh, you know, if anything, our success is, uh, uh, you know, it seems like uh, every couple of weeks there's another streaming slash royalty company coming into existence. And so, you know, one of the common questions that we get is, uh, are you concerned about increased competition being able to do that? Well, you know, we're in a situation now where we're generating so much cash flow. I'm not sure we'll ever have to issue shares again to fund our growth. I think uh, the biggest challenge we're going to have is putting that cash to work. And if, if we can't invest it into the ground, then we have to find a way to return it to our shareholders. And so it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a win-win. We can't continue uh, growing the company to, at the same level as the cash coming in. It just means the dividends are going to grow. And so, so we're in a situation like that. Um, you know, with the increased competition that we've seen, I, I would also say that the, the strength of the streaming model um, and, and really highlighted by our most recent transaction with Capstone, uh, um, where we saw good strength in their share price after announcing the deal and our share price. And, and it just sort of shows the value that we create with streaming transactions. So I would say that along with the you know, increased number of competitors, uh, you know, albeit a lot of them smaller scale, we're also seeing a, 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 an increase in, in demand for streaming agreements because the, the mining companies and the development companies out there are truly realizing that, that a stream is a way to take a good mine and make it a great mine. Okay. First of all, uh, we'll talk about the competition just a bit. Increased dividends. Are you, can we expect increased dividends this year? 
Well, definitely, because our dividend policy is tied where we take 30% of our cash flow and give it back to our shareholders. And so just by virtue of the fact that we've got good, strong, organic growth this year combined with higher prices. Now, we do average that cash flow over the previous four quarters. Commodity prices were lower four quarters ago than they were right now. So we, in 2020, we took our dividend from the start of the year from nine cents a share up to 12 cents a share which is you know, 33% increase over the course of that year. And that's, that's only up to the end of the third quarter. Our fourth quarter, our year-end results are coming up here in a month and a half. I can assure you that, that on a per share basis, our dividend will be growing because all it takes is averaging out our cash flow and, and, and knowing that we're going to commit to at least a minimum of 30% of our cash flow going back. And, and if we continue to see, well, our organic growth is a given, we've, we've got growth coming through this year, but if we continue to see stronger precious metal prices over the course of the year, it, it immediately de- delivers returns and growth on the dividend side right back to our shareholders because our dividend is linked to our cash flows, directly linked to our cash flows. So we will see growth in the dividend. Uh, I wonder how streaming companies can remain competitive. What's your competitive edge or strategy that you're implementing? Is it just lower rates you're offering your partners or is there something else too? Well, Wheaton focuses, we at Wheaton really focus on trying to deliver value after the upfront payment. You know, traditionally, royalty companies uh, always sort of, you know, purchased the royalty and then just collected the check every few months or every month or every quarter and uh, would send in the auditors. We at Wheaton really have a strong belief with the streaming model. First off, it's a partnership. Uh, we work with our partners, and even though they still operate these mines, we are constantly looking for ways to deliver value afterwards. And that comes from providing technical support. We've got a technical team, we call them technical ambassadors, that is willing to provide technical support at no cost. We realize that the stronger our partners are, the stronger we are. That's that's that, that's a, you know, it's an overlying mantra in, 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 in our own belief system here within Wheaton. And so we're constantly looking for ways. The other aspect is, uh, you know, on, on an ESG or a CSR front where we, we contribute, we're the first ever of the streaming slash royalty companies to contribute to our partners' programs to maintain strong social license, to, to match funding into communities around the mine sites, to make sure that our partners are contributing good, strong, sustainable benefits to all of their neighbors, all of their communities. The stronger their social license is, the more successful they are. The more successful they are, the more successful we are. It's the right thing to do. It's 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 the way you know we we focus on this, and it's one of the reasons why you know recently Wheaton was uh, you know as the top precious metals company by some of the ESG rating firms out there in terms of our contributions back to that. So so at Wheaton, we really do try and focus on delivering value after the initial upfront payment, after the initial purchase, after the initial initial funding. Um, you know, we've, we're constantly looking for ways to deliver that extra value back to our uh, partners. Okay. And uh, with interest rates as low as they are, would you consider banks a competitor right now? Well, debt, uh, you know, in my eyes, we work with debt. If, if someone's going to fund a project out there, I, I think where our, our, sort, our capital is most competitive is up against the equity side. And even though there's strong equity support, what we have to recognize is, it is in the base metals industry, most base metals companies trade at a discount to net asset value. By selling their precious metals into a streaming company like Wheaton, um, they actually sell that non-core precious metals byproduct that is a non-core asset in their portfolio. They sell that at a premium to how their own market, to their own shareholders are valuing their company. And and so that's where we compete the best um, is, 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 um, is the fact that uh, you know we come in as an equity shareholder. We, uh, we own a part and we take the production risk on these projects. We really do, uh, you know, we truly are an equity shareholder in, in, in these uh, assets as they move forward, as opposed to bank. Bank debt, um, you know, it, it, it has a role, uh, but I can tell you we've spent the last, uh, you know, the bulk of our transactions over the last five years have been helping companies that were over levered, that, that went too far into debt and, and had to deal with the banks. And so, so they would come in and, and we'd have provide funding just so they could uh, uh, strengthen up that balance sheet. So how does, how does it work in your industry uh, in particular for you? Do, you? do you Are you kind of like an investment bank? Do you go out and pitch your deals to companies or do they, do they approach you and say, hey, we need funding, Randy, can you help us out? Or maybe a combination of both? Yes, <laughs> quite simply, both. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, it's, uh, um, you know, 
as as you know, I was part of this company when we created it back in 2004. And you know, people have asked any regrets, any mistakes, and, and I regret not spending, not not getting more aggressive about this. We we created this company out of Gold Corp originally, and uh, and we really didn't put any focus into the original Silver Wheaton for a couple of years. But by 2007, we uh, we really you know sort of put in a dedicated, focused team on this streaming business model, and 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 got out there um, and and started building the company. And so so. Um, the, the 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 streaming option as a source of capital has become more and more, <laughs> no pun intended, but more and more mainstream. <laughs> uh, it's widely accepted. And I don't think there's a single CFO anywhere in the world now with a resource product product or project. If they're needing capital, if they're having to source capital, obviously if they're a company that's generating enough cash flow internally and can fund their own growth. Perfect. They don't have to go outside of their own business to source that capital. But if they have to go outside of their own business to source capital, they have to look at a number of options. You can you can uh, either sell off a non-core portion of your portfolio to fund that growth. You can go and issue shares and dilute your existing shareholders, or you can go to the banks and get debt. Um, and that's we step in on that portfolio optimization side where we sit and look at the the copper company and say, do you really need that gold production? Uh, Cause we're willing to pay you this much for it. And it doesn't take much to, to make it understand. And, and one of the huge advantages of streams is that the fact that we're an equity partner means that we rise or fall along with the success of that project. And so we do share that project risk. There's no guaranteed minimums. If we're selective and if we're intelligent about which assets we invest into, we'll be incredibly successful. And I think Wheaton's got a pretty strong track record on that. I think we've got one of the highest quality portfolios in the entire precious metal space. But um, you know, uh, the huge advantage of streams from, from that CFO's perspective is that when he looks at that project, and 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 works out the uh, you know what kind of rate of return you can get by having us come in and contribute capital up front for our small little non-core byproduct production from that project. We dramatically increase the internal rate of return of that company's uh, capital invested. And I can tell you that's the one criticism, and and it's the one thing that the mining industry is answering to. But it's been one criticism is the return on invested capital that this industry, especially the gold industry, has has had in the past. So how are you different from a private equity firm? Uh, well, the, we have private equity firms that are now venturing in, but we do take project risk, and that's a it's, you know, it's a bit unique, but. Uh, but you know we're not doing it as a shareholder, so to speak, and we can't buy or sell the shares. Once we invest into a project, we're there for life of mine. So we have to be, um, you know, we have to be wise on, in terms of which projects we invest into. But uh, I can tell you that we've had some private equity firms step into the streaming business and take the same approach as us, uh, and they do form some of our competition. Yeah, that 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 does make sense. And my final question, which leads perfectly to my final question, is how you pick your partners and. Uh, if you could just sum up very quickly some of the criteria you're looking for. Well, the, the most important criteria for us is profitability, is uh, what kind of operating margins do these assets have? And, you know, proud to report that, you know, as, as I mentioned, we've got 31 assets in our portfolio. 23 of them are delivering us metal today. So we've still got another eight development projects that will be delivering us growth over the next few years. Um, those projects, 73% of that production their core product. So that's to say, if we get gold from a copper mine, that copper that's produced at that copper mine, uh, 73% of that of that production is in the first quartile of the copper cost curve. So this is, you know, we're focused on assets where our partners are also very profitable. And, and you know, obviously we're profitable because we have the fixed cost base on these. We want to make sure that our partners are profitable. Again, going back to that overlying mantra, the stronger, the healthier our partners are, the healthier, the stronger we are. And uh, and so that's the number one criteria that we look at is the asset itself. How how uh, how strong are the operating margins in this asset? Obviously, uh, geological potential comes into play, resource potential, exploration potential. Uh, we do want good, strong management teams. We want teams that are committed to good, strong, sustainable development, systematic uh, uh, best practices going forward. And so... Uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, all you have to do is look at our portfolio to, to you know, recognize that uh, how, how important that is to us. Do hit the like button and do subscribe to our channel.